The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus said to his disciples, Now I am going to the one who sent me, and not one of you asks me, Where are you going? But because I told you this, grief has filled your hearts. But I tell you the truth. It is better for you that I go. For if I do not go, the Advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world in regard to sin and righteousness and condemnation. Sin because they do not believe in me. Righteousness because I am going to the Father. And you will no longer see me. Condemnation, because the ruler of this world has been condemned. The Gospel of the Lord. The ruler of this world has been condemned. A little later, when Jesus is being questioned by Pilate. The gospel says that Pilate sat him on the judgment seat, which is interesting because that's the seat that Pilate should have been sitting on to make a judgment. And what the gospel writer is trying to tell you, St. John, he's trying to tell you that this whole exchange between Pilate is really the judgment of God being pronounced on the world. It's not about Pilate condemning Jesus to crucifixion. And so the judgment is revealed. Sin is judged for what it is by the cross of Jesus Christ. And Jesus makes a judgment against sin on the cross. And those who would go to the Father in Christ, they're righteous. And they're judged as righteous. This is how valuable your faith is. Because of our faith in Christ, sin is condemned in us and righteousness is revealed, which gives us a place to stand before God. And condemnation. Those who don't accept the judgment of Christ are going to have to deal with consequences. It's pretty sobering. They are so serious about this, the apostles, that they are willing to even be thrown into prison for this sake. The reading that was read earlier Shortly after that episode that was described, Paul and Silas end up getting thrown in jail unjustly, according to the gospel. It reminded me of a time when um, a few years back, there was a priest in another country. He was thrown into prison for hateful speech because he said something was a sin that everybody said it wasn't. The world said it wasn't a sin. But the scriptures were pretty clear that it was a sin. So in his church, in a homily, he called a sin a sin. And he was thrown in jail for hateful speech. And he took his licks. I was sitting at a table a couple of weeks later at a banquet, a benefit banquet, and the bishop happened to be sitting at that table and the conversation came up about this incident. And so I was kind of joking, but at the same time serious. 
And I said, I said, Bishop, if that happened to one of your priests, do you realize that the state would be paying our room and board for an imprisonment term and we would get to preach the gospel to people who wouldn't ordinarily hear it? And because of the sacramental seal of confession, we'd probably be very respected by the inmates for not being rats in the jail. Isn't this great? Well, the bishop gave me one of those looks like, all right, that's enough. <laughs> but then when you think about, some of you might remember a few years back, something called Operation Rescue. Who remembers Operation Rescue? where people would stand in front of an abortion clinic and engage in an act of civil disobedience. They were told not to be there, but they stayed. And in some cases, they handcuffed themselves to posts and things. And they would be arrested because they would refuse to give their names because they represented the nameless. And they literally tied up the prison system in some places and became a great burden on the state. And it, and it became very troubling to state officials about how to deal with this kind of stuff. One can question the ethics on that. However, where was the sin? It surely wasn't making a statement about who should be living. What's interesting is Paul and Silas get thrown into jail shortly after this reading. They are beaten, and they don't complain. Instead, they pray, and they find that the place to pray. It's classic of what Christians do during a time of affliction, what we're supposed to do. In a time of affliction, when there's no other way out, the way out is on your knees. And so we pray. And in this case, where Silas and Paul are incarcerated, they're in jail, and the gates are broken open. The chains fall off of them because of an earthquake. Really? And they're freed. The guard is ready to commit suicide because his life is in danger because under his watch, these guys get let go. So they remain in jail. They don't move. And they stop the guard from committing suicide. He becomes so moved that he leads them out of prison himself, takes them home, bandages their wounds. His whole family gets converted. And that's only the beginning of a huge rush of conversions. I don't always understand how God works and what his ways are but he finds a way to recycle every single tragedy and something good can come out of it. It led me to uh, something that came to my mind one day, reading stuff like this. I said, you know what? Even when you look at the martyrs, right? Tertullian called, uh, called the blood of the martyrs the seed of the faith. Martyrs always make the church grow somehow. But isn't this what Jesus did? The church grew because the grain of wheat fell to the earth and died and brought forth much fruit. This is what our sacrifice as Christians does. And so it may be considered one day, you know what's the worst thing that could happen to a faithful baptized Catholic? The very absolute worst thing that can happen to you. You'll die and go to heaven. And this is the kind of thinking that underlies the gospel. We're in the resurrection season, and we process things through the resurrection and eternal life. Soon, all our young people in school are going to get a jailbreak. It's up to you what you do at that time now, this summer, though. Whether it's going to be about Christ and getting closer to him. 
Regina Celi, Letare, Alleluia, Quid 